Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome um, to the uh, Ralph J. Bunn Center for African American Studies Library and Media Center. Um, we are very pleased today to have Joseph Dyer, who's going to um, answer a few questions you may have about his new book, um, and he'll also be signing copies of his book, which you can, of course, purchase up here if you'd like, if you don't already have the book. Um, Joseph Dyer was born September 24, 1934, on a sharecropper's plantation in Gilbert, Louisiana. When he was two years old, the author's parents moved to um, Bogalusa, Louisiana, a paper mill town where he and his three younger sisters were raised. His father died when Dyer was nine years old, forcing him to become, quote, the little man of the house, unquote. That meant assisting his hearing impaired mother with the younger sisters. It also meant working in the cotton fields to help supplement the meager welfare check that the family received. In April 1965, fast forward, Dyer became the first African-American journalist hired by a Los Angeles network owned and operated television station, KNX TV, now KCBS. Uh, during his 30 years for local CBS station, Dyer scored many historic firsts at the Los Angeles, at the Los Angeles station. The first African-American promoted into the station's senior management ranks, the first African-American major department head, the first African-American to broadcast uh, station editorials. At one time, Dyer wrote, produced, and hosted a half-hour public affairs broadcast, People's Corner. He did this while still holding down his management position. When Dyer retired in June of 1995, he was credited with receiving some 135 awards for outstanding community service, including the prestigious Abe Lincoln Award from the Southern Baptist Radio and Television Commission for his citywide campaign for sickle cell anemia, and the coveted Image Award from the Beverly Hills NAACP. He also received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Black Public Relations Society of Southern California. I had the pleasure of first meeting uh, Mr. Dyer myself, I think it was back in 93 when I was working with the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights coming to L.A. after the 1992 uprisings. And of course, uh, he had quite a bit to say about that and news coverage of those events as he was at that time still um, a senior management, uh, in senior management at KCBS. Uh, Dyer is married to the former Doris Dillon. They have four children, Monica, Karen, Kimberly, and Joe Dyer III. They also have three grandchildren, Nicholas, Christian, and Melanie. Dyer has now written a book about his life entitled A Retired Black Television Broadcaster's Lifetime of Memories from the Cotton Fields to CBS. This memoir paints a very compelling picture of the author's pioneering years with the CBS Los Angeles station. As an example, when those devastating 1965 watch riots um, uh, erupted, the author was the only black television newsman in Los Angeles. Well, without further ado, Mr. Joe Dyer. Thank you very much. I hope you don't mind writing. Sit down. My wife, Doris, is right in your ear. God raise your hand. Okay, and my daughter, Karen, over here to my left. Good. First of all, let me just say thank you very much for inviting me. I'm certainly very appreciative of the fact that you invited me to share with you doing the annual observance of African American History Month. On three occasions, it was my pleasure to serve as a citywide honorary chairperson for African American History Month. And this past Saturday, I was the chair of Black Office Night, which was very interesting, Black History Month. And throughout the years, on and off, I would serve as the MC, the opening day ceremony, when we stepped to City Hall to kick off for African American History Month. Now, having said all that, I would say that. Uh, I would be, I'm very hopeful that time will someday come when there's no need to celebrate, or to observe an African American History Month. Because the contributions by African Americans would be so incorporated in the textbooks in our daily lives that would become commonplace. Uh, I hope that happens. I'm very hopeful that it will. But I still hope and pray that it comes to uh, a reality. The contributions that African Americans have made uh, cannot be shelved into one month because they're very intricately involved in our daily lives. If you're a man, you get up in the morning, you do the uh, shave and clean, and uh, begin to shave. You have to be reminded that uh, Dr. George Washington Carver, 
a product of over 300 experiments with the peanut that he uh, was able to provide. If you happen to go out there at the intersection and have to stop in one of the traffic lights, you have to be reminded of Mr. Garrick A. Morgan, who invented the device that made the signal light possible. If you're a gobber and you like to play golf, years ago you put the ball on the ground and swatted it. Years ago, a black young inventor invented the tee, so he elevated the ball uh, and swatted it. If you happen to be going into surgery and you think you're going to need a blood bank, you have to be reminded of Dr. Charles Drew. His experiment with plasma and enable blood to be preserved over long periods of time. During World War II, thousands and thousands of soldiers were saved by the plasma that Dr. Charles Drew pioneered. Coincidentally, Dr. Charles Drew himself reportedly died on a lonely Mississippi highway after an accident, because none of the nearby white hospitals would accept him because of his race. We're talking about African American history here, that it should be incorporated not only one month out of a year, but in our daily lives. It should be commonplace not only for blacks, but for Latinos, Asian Pacific people, Native American spirit. It's a human story. I think it's a story that should be told over and they are people without a history as a people who didn't exist. Unless you know about the history, you don't exist. You say you cannot put in perspective where you've been, perhaps where you should be going. If you are, uh, in my memoir, as an analogy, I drew attention to the fact that in Louisiana, my home state years ago, there was a county fair and at that county fair, whites would go to the county fair Monday, this got Sunday through Friday. Saturday was reserved for blacks. And that Saturday, all the blacks, flatbed trucks, pickup trucks, school buses, bicycles, some of them, put, would go to the county fair in Franklin, Louisiana. That was Color Folk Day. Fast forward, people who know what my feelings are in many respects about media. We commonly refer to the time that some of the our very talented uh, minority anchors are placed on weekends, and we refer to that time as ghetto time. I would hope that they would come when the weekdays are filled with the Mark Brown, the Pat Harvey's, I suppose. We Means that it's, I mean, she makes you a science of the weekend to find a permanent home over there. <laughs> We're talking about ghetto time. It's no different than it was back in Louisiana 30 years ago when we all went to the county fair on Colorful Bay, if you will. <laughs> and I would hope that uh, the weekend are not the total domin dominion of minority uh, news persons. Things get a little better as far as our observance of African American history month. You may recall, and you may not recall, that years ago this observance was done in one week. Then it was called Negro History Week. So we're now one month. We only have 11 months to go. <laughs> we'll be observing it all year. And I don't want that to sound negative. It's just a fact of life that I have a problem because uh, during this month, the media would be inundating the airwaves, the stories about African Americans and their contributions have been very laudable and God bless and forth. My problem is that after this month is over, they'll go back to business as usual. And you'd be hard pressed to find something on our airwaves documenting the many contributions of African Americans, the Latino American, Asian Pacific Americans, etc. And that's sad. Again, that's sad. I would think it's left up to some of us who have to be writers to kind of write that ship. And that's one of the things that I've tried to do with my memoir, and that is to create.
create uh, how it was back there some 50 years ago in terms of the racial landscape. This past Sunday, there was a, something on Showtime called the Deacons for Defense. You know, I saw that. Well, that came out of my hometown, Bogalusa, Louisiana. And one of the things I pointed out in my memoir was uh, my awareness of the Deacons, what they did kind of preserve, preserve the peace at that time. And I am convinced because Bugalusa was located are all around a lot of those hamlets. It was a small place that were festering spots for the KKK. And I am convinced that if it were not this highly militant armed group called the Deacons, it would have been a bloodbath. But because most of the so-called uh, racists was aware that the Deacons were guys from the box factory, paper mill, who took shifts every night sitting atop houses, in cars, in trucks. Since most of these guys were coming out of the Korean War and they loved to hunt, they were quite proficient with arms. And I uh, had a gentleman by the name of Charles Sims who came out here and was interviewed on the Lewis Lomax show. Now those of us who knew Charles realized he was a, I used to this phrase for he was a street person. But we made Charles seem like a deity when he came to Los Angeles. I mean, Charles talked that stuff and when I watched the broadcast that night, I said, boy, 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 Charles, please. But Charles let you believe that every able-bodied black man in Bogalusa was a member of the deacon. That was not, that simply was not true. But as far as the world was concerned, it created a different PR job because what it did was give Bogalusa a notoriety, obviously, that it really didn't deserve. But it served the deacon's purpose because it said it sent a message to all the races that if you want, to let the blood bath start coming from the community. It never did. And I think largely because of the deacons so uh, thanks to the civil rights movement, everybody in Louisiana nowadays goes to the county fair seven days a week. And I would hope that sooner or later everybody would be anchoring news broadcasts seven days a week. And sooner or later contributions that African Americans have made is something that we do to celebrate not one month out of a year, but 12 months out of a year, because they are indeed very profound. Now, there's an old saying, in order for a presentation to be immortal, it doesn't have to be everlasting. So I'm going to stop you and answer some of your questions about the book. Uh, I'll start off by saying it's a it's a labor of love, it's a tribute to my mother, late mother, uh, who's along the hearing impaired. Uh, it starts my work along with her, you know, Louisiana cotton fields. Uh, she had to do welfare, uneducated. Uh, the entire racial landscape that she had to undergo, being a, a domestic, being a widow, being uneducated in Louisiana back in the 40s and 30s. It's quite challenging. And in the book, we uh, talk about how we run and hide all the new purchases before the welfare people came to find out indeed if she had uh, got some mess in the house she wasn't supposed to have. To some of you who uh, are much younger, this may be a history lesson how it was back in 40, 50 years ago. Those persons who are over 50, it may be, quite frankly, something that you may reflect on and bring back memories because a lot of it won't be new. You know what it was back there uh, in the Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, things were pretty rough because then you were dealing with institutionalized racism. Uh, everybody understood the rule. Uh, I saw a movie the other night called The Pianist. As I watched that unfold, uh, some of the things in the Warsaw Ghetto, I began to reflect on some of the indignity we as African Americans had to suffer back in the 30s and 40s. Some of it was a little documented, obviously. You walk into a store like the first, you see a truck works in you, and some of the white comes in behind you. They stop, very diplomatic, and you're the white person over there. And uh, I took your head off when you're talking to a young white woman. You didn't ride if you were a white woman in the front seat, passing beside a seat driven by a black man. There were rules, everybody understood the rules. 
failure to understand the rules could be very deadly. Uh, as Emmett Till, uh, like a test with uh, came from Chicago, his sick town, failed to understand the rules, even though his mother had tried to you know, educate him what the rules were all about. Uh, I remember seeing white cops coming to the football field, full of black guys, beat him right there in front of the stands, and nobody moved. One of the most humiliating things you ever want to see, but nobody could do anything. That was the thing that was if you could move, you could be shot, and you could have been executed on the spot. So, um, you come out of that kind of environment, you don't forget. I said, inviting the book, I said, I just want, hopefully, that there's some young people, can, person can read it and understand how it once was. So, next time you see a 60 or 70 year old black person walking down the street, you can truly say, especially that person from the South, I know what you went through. And God bless you for having survived. Uh, we can learn from the strength from the so called elders who came out in the southern regions of our country. And I would not excuse the West Coast or other regions too, because when I came to Los Angeles, racism was very subtle here, but it was very much very prevalent. You know, you take your test and lose it. Sometimes if you were African American, you put into a house. All of a sudden, the application got lost. Uh, but anyway, uh, the book is laced with all that kind of stuff, so you ain't find it very interesting. That's long before I got to CBS. <laughs> <laughs> well, CBS was can I, can I ask a quick question? Well, I have to actually run to um, another engagement, sorry. but I want to make sure this gets out because I think people might be interested in this. Um, when, I, when I first met you, you were telling me the story about how you became um, the first you know, report share that, that story with you. Yeah, very interesting, isn't it? Uh, it, it? And I just want to dovetail on that. As you tell the story, can you talk about, as a person who's lived in the North and the South and out West, can you talk about the overt racism that you experienced in the South and maybe somewhat covert racism that you experienced when you became a journalism, uh, journalist uh, out here in Los Angeles? Yeah. Let me just back up a minute. I went to uh, the airport for four years. And in the airports, I served as the editor of the base paper and producer of the airport television shows Grambling. That provided me the background I needed. But I went to Grambling College. We didn't have a telecommunication department. When I was in school, you could look out the window and see cows walking across the campus. Mm -hmm. We had no small day whatsoever. So my experience in media was going to through the United States Airport for four years. I came out and got a job at JPL, just because my story. And uh, during my spare time, I became involved with the Studio West. Studio West had people like Greg Morris, Ivan Dixon, and gentlemen who were very good for my career. Cassius Brothers, too. Now, Cassius found out that I was a writer, but it was one of my plays, that I had television experience before. Cassius was also aspiring to become a director himself. But in the meantime, as a volunteer, he was head of the Labor and Industry Committee for the Beverly Hills and WACP. And they had been lobbying the uh, broadcasters in Los Angeles to quote, uh, break the ice by <coughs> hiring someone of color. They had interviewed a lot of people, I was told. Some had good voices, but they had radio voices, but none of them had television experience. So Cash wanted me to go in and talk to Roy Healy at Channel 2. He said, you've been on television before, you've obviously written before, we have a good shot with you, Joe. Go out and talk to Roy. And I went out and talked to Roy, not expecting anything. Great, quite frankly. Deja vu, you know. We were waiting. I was really trying to get into motion pictures, quite frankly. But my daughter was tell you, I came out here to replace Sidney Poitier. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I fell quite short. So they were going to come in to the Boom Show and Twilight Zone and look at our work. So I was kind of holding out for that. But I did go in and see Roy, he make a long story short. And uh, he was impressed with my background, and he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give it a six-month try. We'll find out during those six months if you're talented for us, or we're talented for you. And I can tell you, you'll be coming in at 4 o'clock in the morning doing early morning news. Now here, I guess he thought I was going to react. Keep in mind, I used to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, escort my mother down the corner, catch a cotton truck. So to have someone tell me I'm coming into a carpeted office at 4 o'clock in the morning at <laughs> CVS, I guess I was totally, uh, how do you say, uh, 
I had no reaction to Roy. I think he found it pretty interesting. Just one thing I just want to share with you. It's interesting. You know, it's the second morning I was there, I looked up and I saw a janitor standing in the corner and uh, just watching me, the black janitor. And I was working on some coffee at the time, so I did not get a chance to go to the time to introduce myself. The third morning on the job, that, and this is in the memoir, there was a janitorial delegation standing there. Door. About eight people standing, men and women, and they were just watching, just watching, just watching. So that morning I was determined I was not going to let those janitors get away from me. So I dashed on my typewriter and ran and uh, I didn't shake their hand, I hugged them. And I told them that I appreciate it very much if you pray for me. And one old man said, The minute we saw you in there, we started praying. <laughs> one lady said that uh, we were just glad. If we tell ourselves, it wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if one of us someday could be seated in one of those chairs in the Channel 2 newsroom? And I'm glad that I've lived long enough to see that out. As I said in my memoir, I can understand that feeling. Because when Joe Lewis would beat Max Mellon, all of us ran out in the streets because Joe had struck a blow for us too. And when Adam Payton Powell thumbed his nose at the uh, white congressional types who were trying to censor him, we all thumbed our nose with him. When uh, Jesse Owens won those Olympic gold medals, he won for us as well. So I said then, you fight for those persons, the janitor type graduate people, with your success. And I said, Jesse Owens did, Joe Lewis did, Adam Payton Powell did, and I vowed to try it. And years later, when I walked down the hall of the CBS, I would go across the corridor and say hello to a janitor much quicker than I would want to tell the white executives. Because they were there when I needed some help. So, but I'm sorry, of course. So that's how I started. Now here again, uh, it's interesting, one thing to, to tell you. When I uh, got the Channel 2, the Watch Riot broke out four months later. They did not want me to cover the Watch, the watch Riot. The news director was very uh, adamant. He said, no, we finally hired our first black reporter, and we sent him off down and get him killed. Said, that ain't going to set right with the community. So I think it was halfway sensitive to what NAACP may have said if I had gotten hurt down there. So I finally indicated by saying, I'm volunteering to go down there. The big story about that case, and I'm being sidelined because I'm black, I'm a journalist, a trained journalist. So he found the acquiesce, and he said, I can go down and cover the story. There's another problem. We had no black camera crews. All the camera crews were white. And none of them were volunteering to go to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would end up going to Washington, filing telephone beepers back that they would put a picture up there, see, you know, like Joe Dyer reporting. And I'd give my whole report standing in a telephone booth. And that went on until the disturbance kind of waned a little bit and we got our food down in the right? So they, they had you cover it like they used to do with the. Uh the old Vietnam War, where they would put a picture of somebody there same thing. <laughs> and, same and phone thing. it in. As Jerry Duncan would say, and, uh, and here's another report live from the scene, a big news reporter, Joe Dyer, when they put the big picture up there, he had to give my, I made a lot of money on the jury because of that. Some of those reports are picked up on network, too. Uh, is that very interesting, too, that sometimes in passing through police lines, no one was accustomed to seeing a black reporter during those periods. So I didn't put my badge on the outside of my belt, because it was very dangerous, because a lot of brothers looked upon me as being an establishment black, right. and that was very dangerous too. So when you approach the police lines, you had to say, I'm a reporter for Channel 2, well, obviously. Uh, they didn't believe it, so I would reach into my pocket, pull out my badge, and you had to do it very slowly. They didn't believe it. And uh, you talk about tonight, the black guy reaching into his pocket, City's burning. <laughs> you know, it just wasn't safe, quite frankly. The, uh, we're talking about the subtleties over here. It's very interesting. When I walk into a, a room full of reporters who know you is basically white, uh, you felt their eyes on you. And paranoid has something to do with you. just know when you, people are looking at you as if you're free. Right. If, uh, and I know my cam camera crew came with a lot of abuses. I would hear people saying, who's your boss? 
you know, you didn't know that kind of, you can't fight every cotton picking battle. You're fighting all cotton picking day. Uh, I remember when we covered George Wallace, all the white crew kind of stood back because they were sensing a confrontation between me and the government. He was running for president at the time. And George Wallace and I did a little uh, interview. And I was going to ask some questions because I guess the other camera was waiting to see if George and I were going to have edits. So I had to resolve that. I was not going to ask him any racial questions. I didn't want to hear all about the answers. He talked about all the talk about the country. And uh, we didn't get into it. But, uh, to make a long story short, uh, you felt sometimes like a freak. Well, you were. When I covered the assassination of Kennedy, I looked around the room to see if I could see other network reporters. And as I said in my memoir, I didn't see any black African American reporters. They may have been there, I just didn't see any. And they should not have been that hard spot in that room, you know, take like so to speak. But things eventually got better. We all tell you my name is Stan Duke, that you reporter, Kathy Bates, black girl. So finally, and I think I said this in my memoir, to watch riots did more to integrate the newsroom in Los Angeles than all these civil rights organizations surround because for the once the newsroom found himself unable to cover an urban affairs story because they were ill equipped to cover. They had no reporters, they had no writers, they had no producers, they had no camera person. But shortly after then, stations began to hire African Americans. And they realized if we're going to cover all the story, we have to be properly staffed in coverage. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, I worked as a great journalist for three years. And one thing I've noticed is that the journalists that um, even now, the the numbers are still pretty small as far as the black folks in, in the newsroom. Whether it's um, there, there's more now, but it's still relatively the numbers are relatively small. And one of the things that I just I'm just kind of curious about: do you, what do you kind of attribute to? Even though we do have more, we still aren't really probably in terms of having um, you know, uh, black faces in the um, what, what, what would you say about that? Attribute that to anything in particular? Um, I, I think it's part of, partly the industry. Um, it's just not, it's still not part of the black industry. I think that, uh, I'll, I'll answer it this way. I talked to uh, one of our news directors once, because he had gone down to South Central Los Angeles in a symposium, and he came back and he said, you know, Joe, they really gave me a hard time this morning. I said, what happened? They called the accused me of being a racist and blah, blah, blah. I said, you know, I'm not too sure it's always a case of racism. He said, sometimes it's a question of comfort zone. We tend to hire people who look like us, with whom we feel comfortable with, that we don't have to worry about uh, going to the EEOC on us, and we have to fire them prematurely or something. We don't want to deal with all this problem. So when you come to see me, if I can circumvent you for someone that's over here, but I don't have to worry about those kinds of problems. That may be one uh, problem. The other thing is that we have to put people in key positions who make those decisions about hiring. Because if you don't do that, you're going to still find it very difficult for African Americans uh, getting into the business. Because we don't have that system of networking. Like I told you, I got into Kelsey, so to speak. Fortunately, nobody seems to find pressure. Right? When I got a job at CBS, I was able to get people there by shepherding through the right people, giving the right counsel, etc. Another gentleman by the name of Jonathan Rogers, who was my daughter after America, did the same thing at a higher level. So until you begin to put new directors in who were African Americans, uh, CEOs, station managers who were African Americans, uh, we're still going to be coming to that door, getting slammed in our face with the whole thing that you don't have enough experience involved. And I can tell some of you don't think you're there, well, since you know you're going to hear that, go down to put on guard in Chihuahua, Texas, or whatever it is. Get yourself from experience. Come on back and say, I'm a, I'm a professional. And uh, they want to the new fight. It's a hard road to go there. It's not very successful. This is the number two market in the country. It's very difficult to do. You're right, there is a. Uh, and it's slowly declining more. I go to NABJ sometimes. And that's what they're talking about, the declining members of the fourth state for black Americans. And they've been about that. Well, well, isn't one of the things 
and I'm glad I'm not running and I'm glad I'm not running for office, but I'll just say, you know, sometimes it's the flavor of the month and, and, and the demographics of your particular city and so on. If I as I go from different cities and I'll, I'll look and I'll see who's on at what time for the local news, national news, and so on. Um, it, it, it's, it's almost like you mentioned the ghetto time, certain people on it, certain not. But then you, if you show your skills and you work your way up, then you, you're like the Pat Harveys, the Mark Browns. Uh, heck, even Jim, and I'm sure you were there and you brought in Jim Hill because I know he's been probably at CBS, what, 50 years now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, he's been there a while. I mean, he left, he, he went away, he was tempted by ABC and right. did the national thing, and it wasn't palatable for you the side, and he came back. But um, it, it's almost like they look at demographics and say, okay, we're, the city is moving in this direction, let's move in this direction as well, or... Um, let's look at this kind of uh, person instead of somebody just for their skills. You know, I, there was an article in the LA Times maybe a few years ago talking about how you had a lot of multi-million dollar uh, news anchors here in Los Angeles. And then there was an article maybe no more than a couple of years ago saying how a lot of these multi-million dollar anchors aren't getting their contracts renewed for that same amount. Um, and, and it's, you know, maybe in the 70s, 80s, it was the big thing, you know, Jerry, he was at CBS, and he, then they paired him with Tawny Little when I first moved out here. I'm like, who is Tawny Little? Everywhere I would go, it was like, oh, the Tawny Little fan club, and I'm like, who is this? And they said, oh, she used to be Miss America, or Miss California, and whatever. I'm like, and? What does that got to do with the news? And, and I noticed that L.A. is a different kind of breed when it comes to news. This is the only place I know where everyday weather is the top story, like rain. You know, if you have really bad weather, you know, on the East Coast, okay, that makes sense. But, you know, a little rainstorm, it's the number one thing. And I feel as if, and I know you, you did a great job because... Um, been bringing in people, and then as you moved up into management, you were able to connect with your community. But human interest stories in a city like Los Angeles, the fluff that is on there, it's incredible. And CBS can't be accused of it as much as, and I'll just say ABC and Eyewitness News, and I think that's just a national format, because wherever you see ABC in any any city across this country, the format is the same. It's like sensationalized, you know? So, I mean, what is your feeling about when you see hardcore journalism starting to turn into fluff, turn into like, uh, what the term that they use, where it's entertainment and news combined? Well, I you tell you, in LA, that's going to be very much in vogue. I know time is Right here, so I'll be very brief. Uh, most stations in Los Angeles have gone to Hollywood with their news. It's not unusual for the lead for the Academy Award, uh, the Emmy, or uh, something that, that that else. You know, the mountain may be sliding all over the place. They still leave with that. Correct. Well, I used to have an old thing in our staff meeting sometime, and I think I ticked a lot of people off when I commanded tonight. I said, you know, if you, uh, Watch our news and cut the audio down. If you saw an African American on our air, you thought he was talking about poverty, he was talking about crime, he was talking about welfare. I mean, very seldom would you find that same African American talking about the Dow Jones Industrial Average, global warming, something in the Middle East. If there are kids out there who watch those broadcasts, and this, the message we're sending is that our black leaders can only talk about things like poverty and welfare, such as something. And I talk about issues that are more global. And the response I got in the staff meeting said, well, we don't have the resources to find out who these people are and talk about the Dow Jones and Dust Leverages, uh, global warming, 
and then uh, my whole response to that, that, that you seem to have no difficulty finding other people who can talk about the same issues, I think. There has to be a concerted effort. And something else I should tell you, you talked about demographics. There is sometimes has been pressure brought, especially specifically in the Latino community, throughout a number of years on stations to have hiring reflect the percentages in the workforce. If you're 37%, they say, well, half of those should be the new staff should be Latino. And they made a good case out of it. So stations become, became very sensitive to license challenges. Uh, years ago, the black community was very vocal. They come out there and say, we're tired of seeing this and that and this and that. And stations would comply because of their license. We don't see too much social activism in media among black leaders right now. I think a lot of them are getting older. They're tired. They're going on trying to survive. It's not a knock. It's a state of the art. But we needed more young Turks, more young people with the energy level who take this on, who are concerned about the media. So you're talking about our kids over here, uh, who are really going to take it to the media. And, and, and it's funny you should mention that because, once again, uh, weather plays a factor in this. The FCC commissioners were going to be at a, a major a workshop conference at USC, but it was postponed because of the weather and they couldn't get out of get out here. Our director, Dr. Hunt, was going to be on a panel with uh, Paula Madison at, at, at KNBC and, and discuss certain things about network uh, ownership and minorities being involved in the process. Um, and I think more people, like you said, should participate and go to those things and voice. Because uh, one thing that I, I know working in a nonprofit, we knew that uh, stations had to do certain things to get their license, and they needed to work with us. And I had no qualms in asking them to support for an event. Uh, and, and it's a win-win situation, I think, when that happens. Because, you know, oftentimes they would send a reporter out and we'd be covered. Same thing now. I know your buddy, Larry McCormick, he works with us on our Thurgood Marshall dinner. And he, but every year he's usually with the Urban League and they get coverage of that event because they have one of their reporters out there. Um, you're right, I, I think one of the problems is a lot of people aren't as savvy and haven't been trained to work with the media to hold them responsible in the ways that they can, not only with the community activism, but also in what's being projected out there. I'll tell you something, that, uh, I'm sorry, Diane. No, I was just going to ask that question, if uh, FCC Rules and regulations to me seem to have been watered in the last few years. Mm -hmm. And so much is happening in that venue, you're right. I think as citizens, we need to keep their feet to the fire. There are just too many things. You know, all the news sounds alike. Right. Everybody, it's a conglomerate. Everybody is, you know, you, you hardly know who owns what anymore. And I was just wondering if that top layer had something to do with the bottom. Well, you've got to understand something else, too, and I, I'll say this very slowly and carefully. A lot of your top people in the FCC go on to corporate America yeah. and do very well. Yeah. Very well. Because they have uh, played the game. The Unity Republican Party takes care of their own and own so over the other side. That's one of the things about Brother Powell, who's not a chairman of the FCC. They want to, he can come down strongly, stronger on these stations over here in terms of mergers, ownership, etc. And you stand back and say, well, wait a minute. He's going to leave the FCC in 15 minutes. And uh, he's going to you know, look at the job, too. He's going to do the same thing that others have done. So what you have, you have people who are using the FCC as a way station for bigger and better things, quite frankly. And the FCC in recent years, you're right, watered down their rules and regulations. When I first started doing license renewal to Channel 2, we had to do a report about the AB. And before I left, that report looked like something like this. Radio was deregulated. Get away with murder. Now, in that environment, you can see how difficult it is for community groups to do battle. You have to really make a case to the FCC in order to challenge a license. And it can be done, uh, quite frankly, but you have lawyers, <coughs> and 
everything up to try to make, make a big case out there over a period of, of, of months. But what it does is it, it frightens the station. When you say license challenge, everybody stands to take note. I see people in the community, they jump me in the community and say, look, we didn't like what you guys had on the air last night. I said, write me a letter, please. And I'm still waiting on those letters. Right. Because letters are a valuable documentation that somebody's angry with this. And I have to file those letters with the people responsible. We find out that people do a lot of bluffing in the meeting when you say, okay, help me by sending me a letter. Say the same thing in that letter you just finished saying to me on this floor. They won't respond. People, people just don't like to write. I worked in government and, you know, you want them to write so that, even if it's your boss, and you want you may disagree with the elected official. You say write the letter. He's got to respond. You you never get the letter. But yet, if you're with him, out, oh, I told so and so, and and yeah, but you didn't write it. You know that's kind of. I just want to say this as as we continue that I've had a personal opportunity to work with Mr. Dyer, and as he transitioned from journalist to management, and that's where a lot of key decisions are made and were made, he always took care of the, the organizations that were in the community <coughs> as far as, I mean, KCBS didn't have that much money, but he spread it around and I want to personally thank you when I was working with a nonprofit for supporting us and I know of many others when I was at meetings like the Public Relations Society or uh, the National Fundraisers or in LA or whatever, Hey, uh, Joe Dyer over in community. We got a little bit of money from him. So, you know, now that you're retired and, and, and writing your books and so on, thank you for helping many people because the little bit that you helped to, to get to those different organizations did make a difference. Appreciate and if you didn't have someone who was sensitive in that position, um, then I think a lot of, like in my case, we, had, we helped sick children. A lot of them would have suffered as well. Appreciate it very much. I have a question at home. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, a lot of times uh, with the media, um, they don't, I guess you said that they don't allow, um, they don't pick journalists that can speak on the Dow Jones question on certain issues, but they only have us speak on like poverty, welfare, those types of issues. Um, and that you went on to say that they don't know where to find such people. You you don't you know they need to look so far as BDT. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ed Gordon speaks on on uh, the Dow Jones and international issues. Tanner Smiley, and I'm sure that there are others with ABC sure, and you. NBC and CBS, and not being looked at. This in the background of so they're not being looked at. Uh, I'm South African, and in my country, we have a, um, a problem now, but it's very an issue where um, through our constitution, all media and all other uh, entities within the society have to uh, integrate. And uh, as a matter of fact, a couple of days ago, the government had to shut down a radio station, Radio Pretoria, because it, uh, they refused to hire uh, Africans as uh, broadcasters, and, um, editors, and the like. And um, we got it on the radio station was like, well, this is an African radio station that a lot of the people that support our station and listen to us are African nationalists. And that they knew that we hired, or they suspected that we hired Africans or people of mixed race or Indians to work as uh, were, uh, editors, directors, and whatnot at our station. They wouldn't listen to us anymore. And the government basically said, you either comply to the Constitution or we have to shut you down. And they, they basically did. And right now, the radicals within the African community are now threatening a civil war because they're saying our only radio station that would stand up for African nationalism and African culture, you shut it down because they wouldn't hire black or colors or Indians. But we have the same uh, kind of problem. But here in America, for them to say that they don't have African Americans that can speak on issues of, of the Dow Jones Industrial Average and what's going on with, with uh, the crisis in Iraq and North Korea, 
it's preposterous to me. It is. And I just want to know, uh, is, is that just the end game for the, the people in the national media, as it's used to say, that they, are, they don't know where to look to find these individuals? No, my or? response to them is this. This is the age of computer technology. You can go to your internet and get almost any resource person you want to speak knowledgeable, knowledgeably about anything. That person will get color, I'm not color. You can build a directory of persons who are African American, Latino, the Asian city, who have expertise in certain areas, if you are sincere. Now the easiest thing to say, I can't find them. That was the, that was the stuff they were using before I became uh, in the media. We would like to hire a black reporter. We can't find quote, qualified blacks that help caches. So the caches delivered means that here's a guy who's written for Ken Rex in Grand Fork, North Dakota. He spent four years in the Air Force writing for television. He edited the base paper. Now, what's your excuse now, Roy? And Roy, Roy's response is that we would hire you uh, six months trial basis to see if you can cut the muscle, quite frankly. But he had to cover, cover all the loopholes, quite frankly, because they're calling the caches. They were continually being told, we are not racist cashiers in WACP. You give us the qualified people. You've heard that story many times. Uh, we, we live and die for the fact that we, we don't have qualified applicants to send people, obviously. So when you start sending qualified applicants, then uh, you get the stuff you're getting over here now, the circumvention, if you will. But like Thurgood good Marshall once said, the struggle continues for all people of color. So the ship is right, quite frankly. You, you can't. Uh, uh, Jackie Robinson had no saying. Somebody told him once, he said, God, you got amazing made, made for you, really had it made. And he wrote a book and said, I never had it made. People see me in the street and say, Boy, you got it, you got it made over CBS. I said, I do. I said, Yeah, because when I go behind closed doors, I didn't have anybody that I could go to to provide me counsel. I was providing everybody else counsel. I was on a game in town. On any given day, I'd have people in, the, in the, uh, my office waiting for counsel. Uh, somebody had done them wrong. Somebody, had, whatever the case may be. And I said, I wish I had that luxury when I was coming up at Channel 2. I didn't have that. And that's one of the bad things about being, quote, the only one. Because when you're there, people look at you and say, look, uh, you're here, brother. If you can't help it, nobody else will. <coughs> and you have a sense of responsibility. You really have, because I don't, uh, who will? If, uh, and uh, so I think that uh, people who are offered to those kinds of jobs, and my heart goes out to them, because I know what kind of problem they I'll just share something on this topic. Uh, when I first moved into management, it was customary for management type to have breakfast meetings at posh country clubs, and I was the person being the manager. So I received a missive on my desk one morning this. You are to attend, I just got into management, this is a memoir, a mandatory breakfast meeting at the Jonathan Club. So I come out of news, and I know damn well all about the covenants at the Jonathan Club and that kind of stuff. And I was, I was, I had resolved, I was not going to tell anybody about that snafu. I said, I'm going to see what the hell happens. When I walk up to that damn door, and knock on that door, and they open that door and see my black face, there's going to be a crisis. Incident. And I said, maybe we can buy this back in Bogus, Louisiana. But fortunately, somebody discovered this snafu because they were so accustomed to sending that, those kinds of memoranda out to all whites on the staff. They weren't accustomed to having a black guy on the staff. And all of a sudden, they said, no, no, it won't be business as usual now. There is some that black speck in it on it at White Hill. So you got to be very careful now uh, how you send out these kinds of things that. A basic routine in dealing with all whites. But they're not routine when you deal with a system where there's still basically a lot of racism. But that, uh, if I had walked through the Jonathan Club and told I couldn't walk in, all of a sudden CBS has been involved in a maintenance that the general manager probably would have gotten fired because he, New York would have determined that he should have known better. And that's projecting me to that kind of thing. Now, about what year was it with this event? Uh, I moved into management in 1968. Oh, okay, so that was that uh, and, and if she had a question, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Mr. Dyer, I just wanted to let you know my home is Grand Cane, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And I went to Grandma. Oh, 
The book seems uh, very interesting, and uh, although we just learned about it this morning, we plan to pick up a copy at a later time. But my question was, and this this kind of is tossed around in my household quite a bit, as to why is there and uh, so many say black uh, weather men who I feel this uh, from like Aaron Roker who who is very qualified and you, when you see him do interviews or reports for he's very qualified but yet uh, he and other ones like Christopher Nance are kind of uh, stuck with the weather. Why do you think that is? Okay, there are two ways to define that. News is usually divided among journalists into hard news and soft news. Mm -hmm. On the soft news category, you find weather, you find sports, you find entertainment. The soft news stuff that you can get a former entertainer to entertainment, former athletes to do athletics, you can get somebody who knows weather, meteorology 101 to do weather. But when you come over here to hard news, those are your no-nonsense journalists, those people who presumably have labored for years covering fires and riots and blood and blah, blah, blah. That's where your big money comes in, quite frankly. It's very difficult to get those kinds of jobs unless you have amassed quite a bit of experience. So what happens, you find more uh, weather guys that come out of the south. It's easy to get jobs down here for weather. You could be very good, you know something about meteorology. So you come to the West Coast and you can do a transition much easier, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. You take that same person, come out and say, I want to get a job as an anchor. That conversation changes. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how it changes. So that may be part of the answer because uh, I had a news director once who told me if he had his brothers about it, he'd have weather, sports, and uh, combined in a two minute segment done by the same person. <laughs> Because you know, he thought the whole thing was tremendously embellished, and he thought uh, he was taking that money and done something. Else. But someone mentioned about the flood stuff. Uh, I had a whole thing whereby I said, if you need a lot of happy talk, in some states you're good at happy talk, if you took the amount of minutes that they devoted to happy talk and added them up, you may have about 17 minutes of time left to do some hard guts of stories about some positive things in the community. If you take that stuff up a lot of fluff out you, you mm -hmm. kid, kid, you, you angles are kidding each other. Right. If, uh, and you got yeah. something on it, we'll see the fellow there, we were housing project, a good project that didn't make the air because you took the cotton picking time and talked a bunch of nonsense. If, uh, and when I get in kind of staff and I say, look, if we minimize the habit talk, we can probably shove some of these stories in that people are blistering me about out there saying, you don't have balance. You got a steady diet of murders, sh shootings, drive-by, and everything else. And, uh, but you don't get enough about the old lady who walked the streets at night trying to keep kids off the streets. Or the old lady who travels 10 miles to take something to a senior citizen home. They're good stories. But those stories are difficult to make air because they're not given the same priority. They, they are soft news, what you understand. So as a result, you don't have a lot of them down the story. So that was my problem because I'd go out in the community a lot and people would get me with stories. Good stories. And my job was to go back and write it up. Then battle with the news people the next morning at the production desk. That's why that story should uh, make air. And I had another problem too because I tell people that a story the morning at 8 o'clock meeting they said, okay, we're going to go with this story over here, Joe. I pick up the phone and call uh, the people in the community. And your story's going to make air should be on at 5 o'clock. Well, that was 4 30, they dropped the story. And they got all these people waiting around the TV set, waiting on that story to air at 5 o'clock. And it doesn't make air. And guess who they're going to call at 6 o'clock? <laughs> Absolutely. But that, those are the things. The station manager? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, they're called the station manager, yeah. So you live and die with that kind of stuff, too, because I got to the point where I would always. Uh, here's my bet by saying, look, uh, they planned to cover your story at five. Now, be aware that stories are continually being made all during the course of the day. And it's a chess game. They've taken out stories and put in stories. 
and uh, sometimes they take out human interest stories, put in a story where somebody got shot down in Absolutely. Yeah, that's just the craziest thing. Uh, I just don't, I mean, <laughs> but don't you say that's, 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 it's a wow, look, who cares? You know, you know, if you, you know, you want to do a crawler at the bottom of the news saying avoid certain highways because this is going on for safety, that's fine. But to show the vehicle, wait for the guy to run out of the then watch him crawl over a wall. I mean, come on. Every, are they hoping they're going to get another? Right. Yeah. Are they hoping they're going to get another Rodney King? Are they? Are they hoping something's going to happen? I mean, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. One of the one of the things I would share with you that's very promising. Paula Madison of NBC had made it clear: as long as what she says, as long as I am the Jeff Vice President, General Manager. NBC, you've seen your last car chase. No, oh, well, that's that's that refreshing to know. Because it's crazy. It's uh, people are tired of it now. Look, 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 look what you've done in the process. Do you realize how many stories you you killed? Yes. To accommodate one car chase that goes on <laughs> twenty minutes. Uh, oh, oh, long, oh, long, oh, long, oh, twenty minutes. Hell oh, yeah. That's not a car chase. That's a commercial, man. You know? Come on. But you, but you know, one thing that that I know that uh, when you talk about the human interest stories and ones that get cut in this day and age, where we've had a lot, we had these news magazines or the uh, public affairs shows. A lot of them get put into that, and you get credit for having your public affairs Absolutely. time on the weekends at 3 in the morning or, or whatever. It, it, it's ludicrous that they put it on at those times. Right. Because you know? right. people, I think, really would watch it. I think that if you put it on at a fairly decent time, and I, and I, and I picked on ABC earlier, but one thing I do, I have to give them credit for, at least on Sunday mornings at a reasonable hour, uh, they do put some of the uh, public interest stories on uh, like Vista LA right. and, and, and right. even Channel 5, uh, they moved uh, making it the minority business thing to certain times where it was, it was feasible, feasible, you know, but rarely is anyone get up at 4 or 5 in the morning to, to see Dyer's Donut Company and the, the feel good story, right. you know, right. hey, VCR and maybe. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the same thing happens sometimes when every year they shop around Tony Brown Journal. Oh. And uh, it's amazing how they play with that stuff. Like you, you're right, they need that to FCC purposes, at least to logging in. Mm -hmm. But look at most stations, uh, by and large, in Los Angeles. They put Tony on some weird hours. You had to really set your alarm clock. <laughs> and finally, he had great shows on him. Right. I'm not promoting him, but he has great shows on it. But the point is, they won't give you that, that, that access that Tony needs. But you're here again. It requires pressure. You've got to apply pressure. It's the same old story. Right, yeah. You've got to apply the same thing you're doing in your neck of the wood. You've got to keep the pressure on. Because in a sense you have pressure, people do whatever they want to do. Right. You see, what a lot of people tend to forget now, if the airwaves don't belong to the media, they belong, belong to the people. They belong to the people. Right. And there was a push at one time for radio that they were going to give up more slots uh, to, to on the on the at the uh, you know the ends because the ones in the middle they're all taken up. Right. But uh, and that was a couple of years ago. I haven't heard the FCC move on that anymore. They were trying they were trying to look for more minority ownership of radio stations, but the mega ones didn't want to give up uh, certain things. Didn't want to decrease their power didn't want uh, the smaller stations in the air. You know, and it's, it's like you said earlier, who owns, excuse me, who runs the FCC? Uh, well, absolutely. In fact, it's interesting that the uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I know the fact that when we first met, uh, he was a member of the uh, EO panel, Bob Fletcher, right. that had public hearings here in Los Angeles. I was one of the panelists who testified for the panelists against media. And very interesting, when I testified, they had a what's called two person delegation from Channel 2 in the police. Now, they had never gone to any damn meetings, <laughs> but they were that meeting. I guess they wanted to find out what, I, what it was I was going to say. Right. And when I had finished my presentation, I think the greatest sigh came from Nantucket. <laughs> the 
That's, you know, I have to try to some people. Because we have to get back to work. Thank okay. You thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. I have copies of the book now. Do you want I'm not prepared. Okay. Sorry, you guys can pick it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, and it had a packed house. You know, our budget was very strong and strong and did everything. And he kind of did a report in the dump of that showing the shortcomings. Well, that's how Dr. Hunt got into getting his, his sociology degree. <clears throat> right after he finished his MBA in Georgetown, he was working for the NBC affiliate in D.C. In, in, in the newsroom. And he was watching how they would cover. And you know D.C. is yeah. pretty minority. Yeah. How they would cover some of the stories there and just the bias and so on. And that's what led him to go into sociology and look at media and how it relates. And he did the, the book on how they covered uh, the OJ trial and how they covered the, the most recent uh, civil disturbance or riot. So. Uh, I want to see when they reschedule it. If you're in town, that would be a good thing to go to that FCC uh, to give your feedback and comments on that. Very, very reviewed. Very reviewed. Yeah, very, very yeah. yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you put it on the list, that I'll, I'll make sure that that's what happens. Um, it, yeah, it, it, with it being the month that it is, there's a lot of competition for the students and faculty. Yeah. I'm glad to see you after all these years. Uh, yeah, Pat's been on the road. She left me a message yesterday. So, so we'll take care of it. No more. <laughs> I want to thank you for your hospitality and invite me over here. Now, I believe from the news release that the book can be purchased at B. Dalton. No, no book. There's no more B. Dalton, is it? Borders and Barnes and Noble. Yeah, Norway. I have some more flyers that okay. I'm going to sign. He did on Sunday, and at the end it has where he could purchase. Okay. Purchase the we have an electronic newsletter as well, and I'm, I'll see that it gets in that. Okay. And then that way, people who couldn't make it today can no, certainly go, yeah. go to the store and, and purchase that. And um, the other thing, if you, um, I take, it's Karen, your publicist? More or okay. <laughs> so Karen, um, since, since we, you know, he's been a speaker here and you guys are all family now, um, let me know um, in Los Angeles. And then I can put that in the newsletter where it's going to be. And then, you know, when we have that, that goes out every week. You know, maybe you develop your own, um, yeah, yeah. like the Steelers had Roy Jarrell's gorillas and they followed it around town. And, uh, you know, I had to get my last Pittsburgh. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll do that. Uh, oh, yeah, I have it since 74. You know? Yes, I have it. Oh. Moved down here. Uh, Thank you very much. Even those hated Raiders moved down here.